All right, now our main objective in the course is to explain uh, the nature of human language and in particular how language relates to reality. And there are certain background assumptions behind that enterprise. Uh, one is uh, that there exists a reality that's totally independent of language. And uh, that view is sometimes challenged. Uh, it's, um, but I think you can't make sense out of discourse except on the presupposition uh, that we are addressing a common representation independent reality, a reality that exists entirely independent of anybody's attitudes towards it. However, um, there are lots of aspects of language that don't quite fit that model. And at some point, we have to talk about those. Now, one of those is often we use language to create a reality uh, that only exists because we think it exists. And I'm thinking of money, property, marriage, government, universities, cocktail parties, and World Series games. Uh, you can imagine those guys going through exactly the same motions as part of a religious ceremony. Uh, uh, but it would not be a baseball game. Uh, what fact makes it a baseball game? Well, at bottom, it's a set of attitudes that we take toward it. And if you think of, of these, uh, uh, if you think of the reality in question as not just a matter of brute physical facts, though there are a lot of brute physical facts, but the physical facts only are the institutional facts uh, because they exist within systems of constitutive rules and they thus are counted as, as we take a set of attitudes toward them. We treat them as a set of institutional facts with corresponding rights, duties, and obligations. Now that's a stunning intellectual achievement and it is it, uh, done entirely by the use of language. That is, there are brute physical movements, but the brute physical movements uh, only count as a baseball game or an election, today's election day, uh, only count as a baseball game or an election uh, because there are a set of procedures, rules, processes, uh, conventions that enable us to behave in such a way that we are counted as, treated as, playing a baseball game or uh, a, a going through an election. Now there's another class of uh, utterances which are not intended to correspond to an independently existing reality, and that's fiction. And I'm gonna spend most of today talking about fiction. Uh, however, just to remind you of the overall structure of the course, uh, first I told you how I thought the philosophy of language ought to be studied as a branch of human behavior. Uh, then I took you through some of mainstream philosophy of language, beginning with Frege and going right up to uh, externalism uh, with Kripke and Putnam and the others. Uh, and now, I didn't do as much of that as I should. That is, I think if this were a conventional course in the philosophy of language, uh, most of the course would be devoted to that, maybe all of it. Uh, but we only have time for so much, so I'm now gonna go back to my uh, primary objective, which is to tell you how I think the subject ought to be studied. And that means we have a series of questions that are, so to speak, left over about fictional speech, about metaphorical uh, uh, speech, about the use of language to create an institutional reality. And most of today's lecture will be about fictional speech. Now there's another element of language that I should mention in passing and that is uh, that language is essential in constructing uh, what we think of as fashions and change in fashions. I teach another course in the philosophy of society, what's the nature of human society. Uh, and today, partly because of the giant's victory, uh, I've <laughs> put on clothing of a kind that I could have worn when the giants last won the World Series. Uh, uh, this jacket was is actually token identical. It, I had it made in Oxford, well, uh, before any of you were born. I mean, like, I guess it was in the 1960s. 
uh, and yet it looks pretty much like a jacket. I mean, it looks like the kind of jackets that guys wear. It isn't as if I came in uh, a, a, a medieval uh, armor. Uh, and though the shirt was not actually uh, was not actually built was not actually made in the 1960s. All the same, uh, white shirts were very common then, and the tie is a college tie. Well, God, those never change. I mean, I, uh, for all I know, it may have been the same 200 years ago. Uh, they say, uh, historians say, in tones of amazement, that the Japanese had a period of 250 years during which there was no change in the clothing fashions. Well, we're not all that far behind. I'm showing you 50 years in which there's no substantial change in men's clothing fashions. It looks pretty much today as it did when I was an undergraduate. Uh, okay, so now we're gonna go on and talk about fiction. Um, I, is there any, any bureaucratic or questions that I should know about? Oh yeah, there are some lectures going on you should probably know about. Um, uh, there is a guy, uh, Dave Chalmers, uh, is giving a, a lecture on Quine's, I think it's about Quine's criticism of the distinction between analytic and synthetic propositions, and so that's certainly relevant to the material of this course, and you might want to look in on that. That's on um, Thursday in the Howison Library. Uh, I said <coughs> that the, uh, uh, the baseball game only uh, counts as a baseball game because of the attitudes we take toward it and not because of the physical movements. And I like to illustrate that with an example. The anthropologists have a problem, and that is uh, they always have to interpret whatever data they get from the cultures they're studying. They have to interpret that in light of their own backgrounds. And particular historical anthropologists uh, investigating the Aztecs or Mayan civilization may persistently misunderstand the civilization because they have very little direct evidence about the intentionality of the participants. And insofar as they do, uh, the, the intentionality of the participants is itself only understood against the background that the participants had. And that may be so remote from our background that it's hard for us to conceive it. See, here's an interesting historical puzzle. Uh, how did Cortes beat all those uh, cent uh, 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 central Mexican tribes? I mean, we're talking about Aztecs, Miztecs, Toltecs, Aranhuacs, and whole lots of others, and he had 150 homesick Spaniards, and he beat the whole damn lot of them. Well, partly, uh, it was because they had a different conception of what they were doing. Uh, the Spaniards were fighting a European warfare. Uh, the local uh, natives had a totally different conception of the nature of the enterprise. The purpose of the enterprise was to get close enough to your enemy so you can hold him without injuring him. Uh, the purpose of that being that you capture him so that you can sacrifice him uh, to the great god Quetzalcoatl. And how do you do that? Well, you take him up on top of a pyramid on a hot summers, on a hot day, and you cut out his living heart with an obsidian knife. They didn't have any metal. Uh, so the idea that the natives had was to get close enough uh, to the Spaniards so they wouldn't actually injure them. They didn't want to hurt any of these guys. Well, uh, for armed men on horseback with European weapons, with metal weapons, that's a very inefficient way to conduct warfare. Uh, and Cortes beat a lot of them. Anyway, that's a problem about the conception of what they were doing. Uh, the Aztecs had a totally different conception of the enterprise they were engaged in. And I often like to think what future historical anthropologists might make of us if they found records of our bizarre civilization. And I once attended a Super Bowl in Stanford Stadium uh, where this uh, came uh, home to me. I was sitting, that was a bizarre experience, I have to tell you. I, it was a long time ago, and I, um, none of you will remember it because it happened, I don't know, almost 20 years ago. Uh, and it was the 49ers against the Miami Dolphins. Uh, and I, the whole thing was so, I don't want to say preposterous, but so extraordinary with all the ceremonials attached that I tried to imagine what an anthropologist say 200 years from now if they found a movie 
of this event, how they would interpret it. And it seems to me they would interpret it at least as the following. First of all, it has to be a religious ceremony. Uh, nobody would go through this amount of effort uh, and, and ceremonial expense and organizational uh, cost just for a game. I mean, I mean, the, the president of the United States came on a on a huge television screen at halftime, and this is while people were flying around the the, uh, the field with uh, jets uh, uh, w with jets attached to their heels. They could actually take off and fly around, and it seemed a great technological achievement. So clearly, it's a religious ceremony. However, it's a religious ceremony enacting a symbolic conflict between the red priests and the green priests. Now, you do not have to have a deep philosophical insight to gather the nature of the conflict. The head priest of the reds was called Montana. Montana. Think about that. If you're puzzled, if you're not puzzled by that, remember the head priest of the green priests was called Marino. So it was Joe Montana against Dan Marino. Well, we know what those words mean. Montana means mountain, the male symbol. And Marino means sea, the female symbol. So the nature of the religious ceremony was that of a conflict between these two primal life forces. Uh, there's no question which one has to win. Uh, the mountain against the sea, uh, the, the symbolism is painfully obvious. Uh, the symbolism is positively excruciating, and you don't have to accept naive Freudianism to see that the mountain has to triumph over the sea in order that the race can survive. And that's really the meaning of this incredible religious ceremony that we're all seeing on this ancient uh, movie. Well, I won't go through all the details, so, but anyway, that's the idea. And it occurred to me, this is how anthropologists have to work. Uh, they have to interpret things uh, that are, uh, <coughs> well, uh, that, uh, uh, that come to us uninterpreted. And their interpretation is typically hopelessly confused by their own set of uh, presuppositions and predilections. Uh, there's actually a funny book about that called The uh, Weens. Uh, and it's spelled this way. Uh, the book, I was looking for a white piece of chalk. There doesn't seem to be one. The book is called The Weens. And it's about a great conflict. Uh, that took place in the 20th century between two tribes. One is called We or Us, and the other is called More Us or More We. Uh, us or meaning More Us. Uh, and the, uh, the Weens have a, a, a great capital in a town named Pound Laundry. That's the name of their capital. Uh, washing, which has to do with laundry, and ton, which is a unit of measurement. So washing ton is translated into our language as pound laundry. And they go on in this way, giving a typical anthropological interpretation of the conflict between uh, the US, the us, and the USSR, which is even more us. Uh, in their story, the more us beat the us. Uh, but that is not how it turned out in real life. Anyway, I'm now going to turn to fiction. Uh, so before we launch into that, are there any uh, questions uh, that anybody wants to ask about what I've said or about anything else? Uh, there may be some bureaucratic stuff that I'm neglecting. Uh, when is your next paper due? We have to get out some uh, fun uh, questions. Well, I'll, I'll think of some questions, but not right now. Right now, we're going to talk about fiction. Okay. Uh, I hold a view that a theory of language ought to be able uh, to accommodate texts chosen at random. So to contrast fiction and nonfiction, I picked up uh, two books off my bookshelves. I'm going to try to get this in such a way that it'll hold on its own. Does that work now? Can you hear it now? All right. Well, let's try it anyway. Uh, the first is a novel by uh, Marguerite Yourcenar. 
Uh, and it's called The Abyss. I haven't read it, I, but I just picked it up and I'll read you the first sentence. Now, your scenario, it was an interesting woman. Um, uh, she is the first woman ever admitted to the Academy Francaise, but she actually lived in New England. Uh, I, I, she lived with her girlfriend in New England, I think, I forget, in Maine or somewhere. But in any case, she wrote beautiful French, and uh, her best novel uh, is called The Memoirs of Hadrian. Unfortunately, the first part is much better than the later parts because she, like a lot of novelists, she got exhausted and couldn't maintain the level of, uh, of quality. Okay, here's the first sentence. Young Henry Maximilian Ligre was making his way toward Paris, taking the long journey in short stretches. The bones of contention between king and emperor were nothing to him. What counted was the peace signed only a few months back that was already fraying away like a garment the worse for wear. Everyone knew that Francis of Valois, François de Valois, still cast amorous eyes upon Milan, much as a rejected lover continued to ogle his fair, his lady fair. Report had it on good authority that the French king was quietly working to assemble and equip a whole new army on the Duke of Savoy's frontiers to send it to Pavia, of course, to regain his lost spurs. Uh, okay, now what's going on in that passage? Well, it purports to be an account of a young man uh, traveling, obviously, a long time ago. I, I forget when uh, 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 Francois Valois lived, but it's, let's say, uh, 16th century. He's traveling uh, at, across France, and he's discussing the political situation uh, with uh, about Milan, uh, and the failed effort to capture Milan. Uh, okay, so now notice interesting things there. It's as if he were making statements. Uh, the, if you ask what kind of a speech act is that, well, it looks like a statement. It actually makes references uh, to actual historical locations. However, the rules are off, uh, the normal rules of statements, because if we ask, well, how do you know that this guy's name was Maximilian Ligre, spelled L-I-G-R-E, was Maximilian Ligre. How do you know there actually was such a person? Well, Marguerite Usenar doesn't know. Uh, it's an invented character. There never was such a person. And it's not an objection to what she says, that there never was such, an, a person, such a person. Now, contrast that, and I literally, about 15 minutes, half an hour ago, I opened up uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, Democracy in America to read at random. In the United States, where public officers have no class interest to promote, the general and constant influence of the government is beneficial, although the individuals who conduct it are frequently unskillful and sometimes contemptible. There is indeed a secret tendency in democratic institutions that makes community, in spite of their vices and mistakes, while in aristocratic institutions, there's a secret bias which notwithstanding the talents and virtues of those who conduct the government, leads them to contribute to the evils that oppress their fellow creatures. A typical uh, piece of Tocquevillian uh, syntax where the sentence runs on, uh, but there are a lot of interesting ideas. Now, um, if you look at the Tocqueville, the normal rules of assertion are in play. If you ask him, well, how do you know that? Did you actually uh, investigate a number of uh, public servants in the United States? Did you actually have a close look at how they behave? Because it is a remarkable claim. A Marxist would say it's impossible that what de Tocqueville said could be true because he's saying that American officials have no class interest to support, uh, and thus, though their behavior is often contemptible, still they tend to work for the common good. Uh, whereas in France, uh, the uh, public officials all have to defend the aristocratic class interest. Now, the interesting thing is that once you read the sentence from de Tocqueville, the language game of assertion, I'm using Wittgenstein's notion of a language game here, the language game of assertion comes into play. You can ask questions such as, well, how do you know that? Is that really true? What evidence do you have? Uh, are there, is there really such a place uh, as the United States and France? 
Uh, you can ask all of those questions in a way that those questions aren't askable or at any rate have a different interpretation if you ask them about the work of fiction. Now, in philosophy, typically, we can put our problems in the form of a paradox, and the paradox about fiction is this. How can it be the case that the words in fictional sentences mean exactly the same as the same words in non-fictional sentences, and that the speech act performed is a function of the meanings of the words uttered, and yet the speech act performed in a work of fiction is not at all the same as the speech act performed in a work of nonfiction. How can it be the case that the words mean the same, but the commitments are totally different? The commitment in the non-fictional case, in the, in the de Tocqueville case, is to the truth of the expressed proposition. But the commitment in the fictional case is, well, what? I haven't said what it is, but it's clearly not to the truth of the expressed proposition because it's not a criticism. You can always see what uh, the, the speaker is committed to by asking yourself, well, what counts as a valid criticism? And it's not a valid criticism of uh, uh, Marguerite de Yourcenar uh, to say, well, there never was such a person as Maximilien Ligot. Uh, and the whole thing is a lie. And that raises a, another interesting question. What's the difference between fiction and lies? Uh, I know a woman who, when she was a little girl, uh, was astounded to discover that grown-ups had been telling her a pack of lies about Cinderella and Snow White and, and uh, uh, the, the uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears and all of that. Uh, there never were such people. The whole thing was a pack of lies. And what's worse, not only did grown-ups lie to little kids, but they lied to each other. They had whole bookshelves, whole libraries full of books which were packs of lies. Now, why is it? What is it exactly? Uh, that uh, she had wrong. What's, wrong. what's the difference between fiction and lying? Notoriously, Plato thought uh, that there'd be no place uh, for uh, poets in the, in the uh, republic uh, of the kind that we uh, 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 give to poets uh, because they're not out to tell us the truth. Uh, uh, so what is it? What's the difference between fiction and lying? We don't think of the author of fiction normally as a liar. Okay, now my first task then is to answer those questions. And I'm just going to repeat stuff that I've said in your assigned uh, reading in, in uh, the logical status of fictional discourse. And the word logical figures crucially in the title in a way that a lot of literary theorists haven't understood. Uh, by, I mean, it, the status of fictional discourse in logic. Is it true or false? What's the relationship between meaning and truth? Why is it that you can have the same words and the same meaning without a commitment to truth? Okay, so I'm just going to give you a set of propositions. First of all, uh, we have to say that in uttering the fictional sentence, in producing this fictional sentence, the author whom I was quoting does not make an assertion, but acts as if she were making an assertion. She goes through the motions of making an assertion. And just to have one word for describing this as if going through the motions, I say she pretends to make an assertion. She doesn't actually make an assertion. She makes a pretended assertion. It's not an actual assertion, and that is why the normal rules of speech acts uh, are not enforced. Now, in order to make that clear, we, may t we need to make a distinction between fiction and literature. Uh, nowadays, we think of most works of literature as works of fiction, but that has not always been the case. I, and indeed, I, there's no necessary connection between fiction and literature. Um, uh, some time ago, I, authors of philosophy were, routine, were routinely taught 
in English departments as examples of English literature. So uh, uh, Hume was a, an example of a great stylist in English, as was Gibbon. So there, it's, nowadays it's the case that most works of literature are treated as works of fiction. But there is a difference. To say that something is part of the canon of English literature or American literature is to accord it a certain kind of value status. There's a certain sort of axiology, a certain kind of uh, award being issued when you say that it is a work of literature. Fiction, not so. Fiction uh, just identifies what? Well, that's what we're trying uh, to uh, specify. But it's a, a clear, I think, just on the face of it, that whether or not a work is a work of fiction depends on the author's intentions. Did the author uh, intend to make, be making a factual claim, or was it a fictional claim? So roughly speaking, fiction is in the author, but literature is in the readers. Uh, it's up to the readers to decide uh, whether or not something is a work of literature. Uh, this is why it would seem odd if somebody says, what are you writing? And I say, well, I'm writing a novel, uh, a fictional story uh, about a philosopher who lived in Berkeley and had hard times, uh, a totally fictional character. Um, I, but it would seem pretentious if I said, oh, I'm writing a work of American literature, uh, or I'm, I'm writing, a, I'm writing uh, a, a work uh, which will become part of the canon, uh, which is part of the canon of American literature. And that's because it's not up to the author. It's not up to me to decide whether or not I'm writing uh, something which is a work of literature. But a work of fiction, that's up to me. It's important to emphasize this because several theorists, literary theorists, have tried to analyze fic uh, fiction and literature as if they were the same, as if an analysis of fiction was an analysis of literature. That's not true. Um, most works of fiction are not intended as, nor would ever be construed as, works of literature. Uh, uh, go into any of the men's rooms in a busy part of the uh, campus, and you will find fictional utterances written on the walls, uh, often of an obscene character. None of those are intended as contributions to literature. You know the kind of thing. There was an old man from Eau Claire, uh, who, uh, all that kind of stuff, uh, limericks and so on, uh, are written on the walls. And they're certainly fictional. Or any comic strip is fictional, but it's clearly not literature. So what is uh, fiction is up to the author. What's a, What's literature is up to the readers. And nowadays, it's become up to sort of opinion makers, uh, uh, professors of, in literature departments who get to decide what sorts of works they're going to assign. Uh, now, there was a period in the 90s, I hope mercifully gone, where people said, would say, well, all this idea of you can distinguish different degrees of quality, uh, that's a kind of elitism. Uh, we can't have that. And or people who even said things like, well, Bugs Bunny's just as good as Shakespeare. Well, no, Bugs Bunny's not as good as Shakespeare, and I'd be prepared to defend that if anybody, uh, uh, to defend the distinction if anybody uh, took it seriously. I don't really think they intended these remarks seriously. Uh, but the idea is that if we take it seriously as literature, it's in virtue of certain features that it has. But the decision is up to us. It's not a matter of the author's intention. Whether or not something is fictional is up to the author's intentions. Now, similarly, we need to distinguish between a fictional discourse and figurative discourse. So for example, whether or not something is a metaphor is independent of the question whether or not it occurs in a work of fiction or a work of nonfiction. Uh, if I say uh, Hegel is a dead horse on the European philosophical market, uh, well, that's metaphorical uh, because Hegel isn't even a horse, alive or dead. But if I say he's a dead horse, well, that I, uh, that gives a certain fictional, uh, a figurative attribution. <coughs> But the remark, if assuming I made it seriously, is not a, a remark in fiction, but it's a figurative remark. Similarly, in a work of fiction, uh, there are a lot of things that are not figurative that are perfectly literate, literal. 
Once upon a time, there lived a little girl named Little Red Riding Hood. Uh, that is perfectly literal. It just happens to be fictional. Okay, so you need these two distinctions, and the point of them comes out when you see that the work of fiction is identified by the fact that the author does not perform illocutionary acts, but pretends to perform illocutionary acts. Goes through the motions, acts as if he were performing illocutionary acts. Now, some people have said, no, no, there really ought to be a fifth kind of speech act, along with assertives, directives, commissives, expressives, and declarations. There ought to be a fictional type of speech act. So everybody got that idea that we ought to think there's a separate kind of a speech act, which is called a fictional uh, speech act. But then one wonders, well, why don't we have a performative verb? I hereby ficked that. Uh, I hereby fic that once upon a time there lived a little girl named Little Red Riding Hood. We don't have and couldn't have such a verb because any sentence that can occur in a work of fiction can also occur in a work of nonfiction and conversely. There's no syntactical marker, no semantic content that identifies it as fictional. Now I'll come back to that point in a second. But it's clear uh, from what we've said that the pretense is entirely a matter of the author's intention. Uh, it, the author's intention decides that it's a work of fiction and not a work of nonfiction. Now, I said that there are no sentences that can only occur in fiction or in non-fiction. But there are certain syntactical devices that are more typical of fiction than they are of non-fiction. Uh, there is a, a, a tense or a, a, a form that the, the French call style indirect libre, uh, where you talk as if you were giving direct quotations, but it's not really direct quotation. You say things like, Sally would never put up with this from Billy. No sorry, she'd had enough of Billy's bad behavior. Now, what's going on? I, I invented that on the spot, so you know you can probably improve on it. But the idea is some things in it are intended as if they were direct quotations. No sorry, we are quoting Sally's thoughts uh, in that in that passage that I just invented. Uh, and that typically only occurs in works of fiction. You don't see that in nonfiction. Why not? Well, there's no way that an author of nonfiction could get inside the mind of somebody that he or she is reporting to report the actual thought in this style and direct libre, where you have the free indirect style as if you were actually stating uh, what the person is really thinking. Uh, but you do it without a direct quotation. So there are stylistic forms that are more appropriate to fiction, but I don't think it's the semantic content that makes them typically occur in uh, nonfiction, but rather it's the epistemic difficulty of actually getting inside the mind of a real life character. So uh, a historian named Lytton Strachey uh, wrote a book called Eminent Victorians. And in the course of that, he outraged a lot of people by trying to describe Queen Victoria's thoughts as she was dying. Uh, and a lot of people were offended by that because they thought epistemically he had no right to try to, try to get inside her mind and describe her thought processes in a way that uh, in Ulysses, uh, at the end of the book, you remember, uh, Joyce tells us what's going on in Molly Bloom's mind. You know, we get her uh, actual thought processes. But you can do that in a work of fiction. You can get away with that because the epistemic problems that go with actually describing people are suspended in a work of fiction. There isn't going to be any question, well, how do you know that Molly Bloom was actually thinking that? where Lytton Stracy faced the problem that uh, he didn't have any way of knowing that Queen Victoria was actually thinking that. He just invented this. Okay, so we got two results so far. One is 
that in a work of fiction, the author pretends to perform illocutionary acts, but doesn't actually perform the illocutionary acts, and that's why the normal rules are suspended. Now, the question arises, how do we get away with that? I mean, how is it possible uh, that people will let us uh, do that? And I'm not sure that all cultures have fiction in our sense. I doubt it. I think it is a, a fairly recent development in Western civilization, and I doubt very much that fiction in our sense, where you have all of these different types of fiction, uh, you have uh, uh, short stories and novels and poems, uh, you have all of these uh, cases where uh, you have a, a pretended illocutionary acts that are determined, uh, whose status is determined entirely by the author's intention. But what we have evolved in Western culture and in some Eastern cultures, I mean the, the Japanese and the Chinese have novels, uh, is a set of conventions for identifying something as fictional discourse. So on Yursenar's novel, Margaret Yersenar, the abbess, it says at the bottom, a novel. And that, I take it, is not fictional. That's not a fictional utterance, the thing at the bottom. That's a non-fictional characterization of the work as a work of fiction. The normal rules are suspended. So we have these conventions, but I want to say they're different from the conventions of serious or non-fictional discourse, because you remember what those give us characteristically are these two directions of fit. What happens in fiction is you come through and break them from the side, and that's why they say they are horizontal conventions. So the woman that I told you about who had not got the idea I, that these weren't uh, lies, she was a very little girl at the time, uh, and, th and she thought uh, grown-ups were lying to each other and lying to little kids because there never was a Cinderella, there never was uh, a Goldilocks and all the rest of it. Uh, and the answer is she hadn't got the idea that there were conventional forms whereby you could suspend the normal rules of speech acts just for the purpose of telling a story or uh, making up a, a joke. Uh, you could do these things, you could suspend the normal rules, and thus you would not be held responsible. And I think there are differences in, in cultures uh, today uh, to how much you are held responsible for when you uh, tell anecdotes about your own life. Uh, people often embellish uh, uh, these uh, anecdotes. And it's, I wouldn't want to say they're actually lying, but just the story seems much more interesting if they dress it up uh, in a certain way. Uh, so certain sorts of standard accounts of things uh, become, uh, they become uh, taken as if uh, they were fact, even though they are fictional. Um, an example came out the other day. After the 94 elections, uh, Jimmy, uh, um, Bill Clinton is uh, quoted as having, having said uh, defensively and plaintively that the president is still relevant. I'm still relevant. Well, that's actually a misdescription uh, of the fact. What actually hap happened, the ha Republicans had a big victory in 1994, uh, and some reporter asked Clinton, are, are you still relevant? Is the president still relevant? And he said, of course, you know, look at the Constitution. Well, there was nothing defensive about that, but then it got embellished in such a way as it meant as if he's plaintively pleading with the, with the reporters to continue to pay attention to him. So you get these uh, distortions, uh, and if you're ever engaged in any kind of public uh, uh, behavior, you'll find you get distortions like this about yourself. And I'm not sure that it's worthwhile uh, fighting them because they acquire a kind of life of their own. And uh, people who are actually important in public life, like uh, Clinton, I guess, just have to live with these absurd distortions. Uh, okay, so far then we got three claims. Uh, one is uh, the Fictional Speech Act is pretended. Its status as fiction is determined by the author's intention. And we understand it because of these conventions. Now, 
this you have to take with some hesitation because, of course, there has to be a first time that you have to be able to start off a fictional uh, style, a mode of fictional discourse. And what we think of as revolutions in literature are often uh, alterations in the conventions. So modernism in the early part of the 20th century, and modernism, I'm thinking of authors like uh, James Joyce and, and uh, Proust and Kafka especially, uh, just operated by a bunch of different conventions. And they were good enough, so they got away with it. So the conventions are always being messed around with. The conventions are not a fixed body of uh, procedures unless you have a very uh, established conservative uh, uh, ceremonial literary establishment. All right, but now, how do you do it? That is, how is it that you invoke these conventions with your intention uh, to perform a pretended speech act? And that leads to the fourth point I want to make, and that is that the utterances, the utterance act is not pretended. It's real. The utterance act is real. So the author of a work of fiction really does produce English sentences. That's not pretended. But this is typically the way pretenses are performed, is that in order to carry out the pretense at the higher level, you really perform the acts at the lower level. I uh, watch children pretending to drive a car. Uh, they sit in the driver's seat and wiggle the steering wheel and push on the uh, gear shift and, and uh, do various other things. Now those movements are real. They really are sitting in the driver's seat and really are turning the steering wheel, but they're only pretending to drive the car. The, drive, uh, the driving of the car exists at a higher level, which they're not actually carrying out. And of course, famously on stage, the utterances and the movements of the characters on in the play are real, uh, but they're not really Hamlet, and they're uh, uh, not really contemplating suicide and all the rest of it. I once, when I was in high school, uh, there was an opera being performed, and they needed some super extras. Uh, I don't know why they trusted me, but I went a lot uh, with a lot of my friends uh, to act in an opera. Uh, I think it was Trovatore. Uh, uh, it was the first opera, first grand opera I'd ever been to. And we had to be, uh, perform in one of the sword fights. Uh, and I wanted to actually, you know, get busy with my sword and uh, uh, knock the swords out of these other guys' hands. Uh, and uh, and the, the professional actors there kept saying, uh, keep the damn thing up, kid. Keep it up in the air. And quit hitting me so hard with it. Um, because they didn't want to uh, uh, take the risk. of uh, These were actual metal swords that we were banging around. Uh, the whole thing was just supposed to be pretending uh, to have a fight, of course. And in order to pretend to have a fight, we had to actually wave our swords around and bang other people's swords. Uh, but they didn't want any, they didn't want the pretense to reach the level of vigor and enthusiasm uh, that I wanted uh, to carry out. Uh, okay, now then, we still have a lot of other questions left. And uh, we, uh, uh, two special cases come up that I want to discuss. And one is a first person narratives, uh, where the author tells the story in the first person. I went to such and such a place and did such and such a thing. And then I think the text of plays is a fascinating test case for us. When you read the text of a play, what's going on? What is the author doing when they write down the text of a play? So before I go to those, let's take questions about what I said so far. I have, uh, with some uh, hesitation, offered you a theory of fiction. Uh, fiction consists of pretended speech acts that are uh, determined as such by the intentions of, of the author in accordance with conventions, and the means by which they're carried out is by actually performing utterance acts. The utterance acts are not pretended, they're real. Now I'm going to go on to first-person narratives and uh, the text of plays. Questions so far, or objections for that matter? Okay, everybody's with us. Well, uh, yeah. Yes. How can we uh, um, analyze the conditions of satisfaction? Yes. Of yeah. Okay. That 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 
the question is, if because it's pretending, how can you analyze the condition of satisfaction? The condition of satisfaction are exactly the same as if it were a serious speech act. But of course, the speaker is not committed to those conditions of satisfaction. So a famous novel by Marcel Proust begins, Longtemps je me suis couché de bonheur. And there are many debates about how to translate that. The standard translation is, for a long time, I used to go to bed early. Now, it's clear what the conditions of satisfaction are. For a long time, uh, whoever said that used to go to bed early. But the, the point, however, is in this case, uh, he's not committed. There's no commitment. If we can prove uh, that Marcel Proust never went to bed early, you haven't shown him to be a liar because this is a work of fiction. It's, he's not supposed to be telling the truth. Uh, he got in a lot of trouble, uh, by the way, with his friends. Uh, there is a great love affair that occurs in, uh, in uh, remembrance of things past, as the English translators have it. Uh, rem um, search for lost time is a better translation than remembrance of things past. Uh, but he got in a lot of trouble because there is a, a beautiful description uh, of, a, of a love affair with Albertine in some of the later volumes. And André Gide, who was a friend of Proust, uh, recognized uh, the emotions there as uh, the homosexual emotions uh, that he knew that Proust had. And he thought this was an outrage that Proust described his homosexual emotions as if they were straight heterosexual emotions and, and was outraged at him. But this was a personal dispute uh, between uh, 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 two people, as we would now describe them, as gay uh, persons. Uh, they didn't have that concept in that time. They were thought of as homosexuals. Uh, but that's not part of the criticism of the novel. That's a rhetorical device that uh, Proust used uh, to describe the love affair with Albertine. Uh, okay, so the, the essential thing is to see the words keep the same meaning and hence the same literal condition of satisfaction, but the author is not committed. The author is not committed to there actually having been such a state of affairs. Uh, similarly, with a, with a sentence that I read to you from Marguerite Yourcenar, uh, where we hear about young Henry Maximilian Legal was making his way toward Paris, taking the long journey and short stretches. I, uh, the condition of satisfaction is there actually was this guy, uh, Maximilian Legal, he went on a trip to Paris, it was a long journey and he took it in short stretches. Condition of satisfaction remain the same because they're exactly the same for the, uh, the fictional as they are for the non-fictional, uh, but the difference is the author is not committed. He's not committed to their actually existing. Yes, at the back, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, uh, let me, I, I, I'm going to answer that, but I want to uh, uh, introduce something uh, before I do that. Uh, when I uh, first wrote this article, and the article that you is assigned to you, uh, I said, well, we need to distinguish the serious intentions behind nonfiction and the non-serious or pretended intentions behind fiction. Well, my God, professors of literature all over the world were furious because they thought I was saying literature is not serious, as if somehow Dostoevsky was convulsed with frivolity uh, when he wrote uh, uh, Crime and Punishment, uh, or Tolstoy wrote War and Peace uh, giggling throughout. Uh, you know, that's not it. They're too defensive. I just wanted a way of marking the distinction between the serious commitment that goes and uh, the, uh, 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 the use of language where you do not have a serious commitment but an as-if commitment. Anyway, I'm kind of stuck with it, I, with the use of the word uh, uh, non-serious, but it's not meant to imply frivolity or goofing off or just giggling your way uh, uh, through the text. I think they're too defensive. I think a lot of people in the humanities have become uh, 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 defensive about their operations. But in any case, I did say that the intentions are not serious intentions, and by that I mean the normal commitments are suspended. Now there is a question. There used to be 
a debate in literary studies about the role of intention in literary criticism. And this was a famous uh, debate. And the problem was supposed to be, how one problem was supposed to be, how can we tell what the author's intentions were? How can we ever know? But that's an epistemic uh, uh, question. And there are times where you may not know exactly what the intentions were. But don't confuse the epistemology with the ontology. From the fact that you can't know, it doesn't follow that there's no fact of the matter to be known. And at the level where I am describing it, there isn't any question about the intentions. Uh, uh, this woman is writing a novel. Uh, she says so on the cover. Uh, and the, no the intention to write a novel is the, if I'm correct in describing this way, is the intention to perform a series of pretended speech acts. So at very subtle levels, you may not be able to tell exactly what were the intentions of the author. But at the very crude, crass level where you're just identifying what type of speech act is it, I, at that level, it's not hard to tell. This is a novel uh, and not a history. Yes? Yeah, well, the author may not have made up their minds uh, or have, may have forgotten. I once went to Japan and I met with uh, three translators of uh, three different books of mine and we, we went to a tea house and it was quite an impressive scene with this enormous elaborate or ritual with a tea. And they asked me questions about these books. Well, what does this passage mean? And what does that passage mean? And they got to a passage and I said, I forgot, I don't know what it means. And they looked at me, you know, as if I just told them to drop dead or something. They, and then they started to laugh. And they became hysterical with laughter. The idea, you don't know what the hell you meant? I mean, you came all the way to Tokyo to tell us you don't know what you meant. Well, how am I supposed to remember some, something I wrote a long time ago? So you get a kind of indeterminacy. You, the author may not know which of these things he I uh, intended, I know nowadays we have a, a great fetish about the unconscious, maybe unconsciously he intended something uh, that did, did not come to his consciousness. Um, uh, I once gave a lecture on logical positivism uh, where I said, well, the logical positives had a tough-minded air about them. And that's, people thought that was a pun on a famous positivist whose name was Alfred J. Ayer, Freddie Ayer, as he was known as. It wasn't intended as a pun, but um, you know, maybe unconsciously I intended it as a pun, but I, I don't think so. So you do have these epistemic problems, but at the level I'm describing, where you're simply trying to identify uh, the, uh, the type of utterance being made, there's no problem that this is a work of, of uh, fiction and that the, the, the speech acts are pretended. Now, there are some authors who are notoriously ambiguous, and you're not really sure if uh, they know what the hell uh, they intended, and some of them are actually pretty good. Uh, uh, my favorite is Mal May. Uh, because I often don't know what the hell he had in mind. And it's still, it's quite interesting. Uh, and it's fun to see how the different translators will translate the same French in really quite different ways, because they don't know what to make of it either. Uh, so Malame is very hard to translate into colloquial American English, and maybe impossible in the end, because we're not really quite sure what the intentions. And also, there are systematic ambiguities in Malame. Uh, and I now, but they're not all uh, poets are worth it. They're not worth the effort of sorting out the ambiguities. Uh, there's an American poet who's notoriously obscure, and I've repressed his name, but it, it'll come back to me. Uh, but in any case, the short answer, I mean, you ask a deep question. The short answer is for the theoretical purposes, we, we don't have to worry about the uh, epistemic problem. How do you solve the, uh, how do you figure out the intentions of your friends or people you know or uh, public figures? Uh, those are the same as figuring out the intentions of the author. And, and there may, in some cases, be no fact of the matter. There may be a systematic indeterminacy in the intention itself. Uh, but then that's an interesting fact about the work 
of uh, fiction that we're talking about if the author himself was unclear in the intentions. How much of Proust is intended as autobiographical? I think a lot of it is, but that's, we may never be able to settle that definitely, and maybe Proust himself wasn't entirely clear about that. Do you want to say some more? It's an important issue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, that you don't have to go to uh, literature or fiction uh, to find cases like that. Uh, often in a conversation, you're amazed at what you say, uh, particularly if you've had a lot to drink. Uh, I'm, I, I'm describing my own experiences here, uh, and, and I, I think there are people. I've sometimes met with other uh, people who I ask them a casual question, and they think very hard about the answer they're going to give. Because uh, they think this is heavy-duty cross-examination they're getting, but uh, there are people who always think carefully about what they're going to say. But there's a name for them; they're called bores. It's just boring <laughs> to have a conversation with somebody who's always thinking, "Now oh, he asked me how I feel. Well, what's he getting at? You see, what's he driving at? Uh, maybe he's getting at how do, how do you feel? Um, but uh, there are so. But th this is a, a, this will kill any conversation if you always try to get exactly your intention expressed precisely. And there are cases, of course, where uh, the intentions have to be disguised. Uh, watch, go into any singles bar and watch a guy trying to pick up a girl. Now, I, it takes a particularly aggressive kind of guy to say literally and exactly what he has on his mind. Uh, and by and large, it's not a recipe for success. Uh, now, Bertrand Russell was famous for the directness of his approach to women. He simply told them exactly what he had in mind, and they either accepted the proposal or rejected it. Uh, he had a lot of uh, failures and rejections, but he was a very self-confident aristocrat. These rejections did not bother him, uh, uh, I guess, not too much. It reminded me of Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth uh, revolutionized baseball. Why? Well, people standardly see, say because he hit more home runs than anybody else. That's true. How did he do it? Babe Ruth struck out more than anybody. Now, before Babe Ruth, the baseball player at the end of the day could feel, well, I didn't get any hits, but at least I didn't strike out. It was a sort of a failure of your manhood if you couldn't at least make contact with the ball. But Babe Ruth saw it doesn't make any difference. I mean, uh, there's no difference between uh, hitting uh, a, a pop-up fly that's caught by the center fielder uh, and striking out. So he was perfectly willing to strike out. He just struck out more than anybody. And after that, there was no disgrace in striking out. A baseball player to, today does not have any more disgrace in striking out than if he uh, uh, hits a weak uh, grounder. Uh, and that's strictly due to Babe Ruth. I'm not quite sure how that connects with Russell and his practices, but I hope you get the idea. That is, willingness to accept a certain kind of failure can itself be a, a possibility of success. Now, there is a puzzle as to why uh, the, uh, the speech acts are typically uh, the responsibility of the male in these uh, situations. Uh, and I, there are several reasons for that. Is, uh, one is I think the level of the desire in the male is probably stronger. But also, I think traditionally, at least, rejection was harder for females to accept. And as uh, women get greater equality, it will be interesting to see how much uh, that changes, how much uh, the willingness to accept rejection in sexual encounters uh, is as common among females as it is among males. Uh, so anyway, these are kind of footnotes to the theory of speech acts, but you, I want you to keep your ears open when people are engaged in conversation to see how much of it is fully explicit. And there are forms of speech acts where it doesn't work uh, if you try to make it fully explicit. And that is what uh, the, the German philosopher Zimmel called, uh, using the French word, coquetterie. Uh, where you are engaged in the uh, preliminary versions of a sexual encounter. His name was Georg Zimmel. Zimmel uh, taught in Germany uh, in the later stages 
of the empire, of the German empire. And there was a real conflict between the intellectuals uh, and the official German militaristic uh, uh, ruling class. So Zimmel always scheduled his lectures in Berlin at exactly the time of the changing of the Prussian guard. So he'd start a lecture on sociology, and then you'd hear the trumpet blast. So he'd stop his lecture, and oh God, here we go again with this stupid uh, trumpet blasting. So there, there'd be trumpet blasts and drummers and uh, uh, Prussians marching around. Uh, and then when they finished, then Zimmel, a serious intellectual, would resume his discussion with this interruption now completed. Uh, incidentally, people say you cannot change uh, cultures forcibly. Well, we did. Uh, we simply wiped out the Prussian ruling class. There is no ruling uh, military, no uh, ruling class in Germany of, uh, mili of Prussian officers. The Prussian officer class as a ruling class in Germany, and it's hard for us today to imagine the amount of power that they had. Uh, that came to an end in 1945. Now, oddly enough, ironically, we were helped by Hitler because, of course, many of that ruling class was engaged in the plot against his, Hitler where they tried to assassinate him on July 20th of 1944. And the result is uh, that Hitler himself uh, uh, killed uh, about three, I, I don't know what the figure is, be worth looking up, but I think it's about 3,000 uh, officers of, of the traditional uh, Prussian ruling class because he thought they were not loyal to him. In any case, this is a case where a ruling class was simply uh, eliminated. Now, I don't understand uh, what happened in Japan. I don't speak Japanese and I'm not familiar with it, but I think we may have done the same thing to the samurai class, uh, to the uh, Japanese ruling class. The idea that the essence of Japan is the fighting spirit of the military class, I think that's over. Uh, but I, as I say, I, I'm completely confident about what happened in Germany because I've lived there and I speak a little bit of the language. But, uh, and, we, and this is a case where uh, military force simply changed uh, the background practices of the society. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, to, we got a little bit, uh, 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 I digressed slightly, but it doesn't matter because I want you to see that the, all these different uses of language and that the serious literal utterance so much prized uh, by philosophers uh, is not necessarily the norm in conversations. Uh, there are all kinds of cases where it isn't a form of deception if you don't make your intentions fully explicit, um, uh, but rather it's part of the social situation you find yourself in. Similarly, I think with certain kinds of lies, uh, it's true that if the dinner was absolutely dreadful, uh, you should tell, if you were speaking the truth, if you were Immanuel Kant, when you go home, you should say to the hostess, the dinner was absolutely dreadful. I found it disgusting in every respect. Uh, but I, you won't get invited to many dinner parties if that's your conversational style. So you say, I very much enjoyed the dinner. It was really great. Uh, everything was terrific. Now, uh, are you to be condemned for lying? I don't think so. I think that's perfectly harmless. Uh, OK, uh, back then to other, as, there are some other people had their hands up. I saw some other hands up around here. Yeah, the very back. Then he did what? I threw the rain in the fire, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, we're talking about the author here. Now the author is pretending to tell a story, I was pretending to give an account of a, a mythical uh, a creature, Frodo, who himself tells a lie about throwing the ring in the fire. Uh, but that's, uh, uh, that seems to fit very comfortably with what I've been saying. That is, the, uh, there never was a Frodo, and there never was an event of either throwing or not throwing the ring in the fire. But this is a case where the story, where story here means fictional, contains uh, accounts of utterances that were themselves lies. Uh, and in the same way, in the same kind of uh, double level, you can get stories within stories. That is to say, you can have a novel, it'd be fun to write such a novel, where the hero of the novel 
constructs a novel, and you, in the course of the novel you are writing, you construct a, novels, uh, a novel given by the hero. Now, that's hard to do, because you've got to get, uh, that would be hard to do, because you have to get a stylistic difference between uh, your own novel that you're writing and the novel that the uh, character in your novel is writing. Uh, Tolkien didn't have that uh, uh, problem w uh, with Frodo. It was all invented, and Frodo wasn't writing a novel. He was just telling a lie on this particular occasion. Okay, other questions um, uh, up with us. Okay, now I want to go to these special cases. Uh, what are we going to say about first-person narrative, and what are we going to say about a uh, work of a dramatic text, where you have the text of a play? Uh, and I didn't have a chance uh, to track down some uh, examples I'd never used before, but I have some pretty good examples here. I quote Sherlock Holmes uh, I, and Dr. Watson, you remember. The Sherlock Holmes stories, with one exception, are all told uh, by Dr. Watson. And Watson says, it was in the year 91 that a combination of events into which I need not enter, he's being a bit coy there, caused Mr. Sherlock Holmes and myself to spend some weeks in one of our great university towns. And it was during this time that the small but instructive adventure that I'm about to relate befell us. Okay, what's going on there? In that case, Conan Doyle is not just pretending to make an assertion, but he's pretending to be someone he's not. He's pretending to be John H. Watson, M.D., veteran of the Afghan campaign, and confidant and uh, roommate of Sherlock Holmes, and he's pretending to be that person recounting a small but instructive adventure that occurred in 1991. So the pretense goes one further step. You pretend not only to be performing these speech acts, but you pretend to be somebody else performing uh, the speech act, and I think that's characteristic. Incidentally, it outrages a lot of people that in this I cite Sherlock Holmes, a mark of Philistinism on my part, uh, they think. Well, let them think it. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the reason I like uh, Sherlock Holmes is it's very clear. Uh, there's no, you know, you don't have to think, well, my God, what did he mean? It's so deep. Whereas you do with, uh, uh, there are passages in, in Kafka or, or uh, even, uh, well, I won't say Proust, no, but in, in, uh, uh, in Kafka or James Joyce, there are passages where you're not quite sure what the hell he meant. Here, I, I don't really think there's some deep subtext that we need to probe. All right, but how about a dramatic play, when you read the text of a play? Well, I went to my bookshelf and I pulled off uh, a book of plays. Now you might think this is carrying randomness too far. I can't stand Galsworthy, but I did pull Galsworthy. I don't think anybody reads Galsworthy or performs it anymore, but anyway, he, d he was immensely influential in his lifetime. And here's Act One, Scene One. Act One, Scene One, this is called A Silver Box. The curtain rises on the Barthwick's dining room, large, modern, and well furnished. The window curtains drawn. Electric light is burning. That was at a time when it was a big deal to have an electric light, so it has to say it's electric light. On the large round dining table is set out a tray with whiskey, a siphon, and a silver cigarette box. It is past midnight. A fumbling is heard outside the door. It is opened suddenly. Jack Barthick seems to fall into the room. Jack, hello. I got home all right, said defiantly. Now, what's going on in that passage? I, you immediately think, that's a boring play. Let's get up and go home. Um, <laughs> but in any case, what's going on in that passage, I think it's very instructive. It's this. What the author of a play gives you is not a, a set of pretended speech acts, but rather a set of instructions as to how the characters and the director are to put on the play. The illocutionary force of the text of a play is a set of directives. So they say such things as uh, a silver box is on the uh, uh, table. Now notice in the text of a play, you typically use the dramatic present. You say things like Hamlet sits, Ophelia stands up, 
Now, in ordinary speech, you never say, you never use this dramatic present. You have to say things like Hamlet is sitting or Hamlet sits on a, on a chair very often. But this, if the Hamlet sits marks an immediacy uh, to the uh, relationship between the speech act and the event that it's describing. So what that tells you is that the characters are supposed to carry out the performance of their actions exactly as described in the text of the play. Thus, the text of the play functions as a directive. The burden of pretense in a play is shifted from the author to the actors. The actors carry out the pretense. The author gives them a set of instructions as to how they are to carry out the pretense. Uh, okay, so now we have, with these five propositions, I think what is uh, reasonable uh, to say is a theory of fiction. Uh, the five propositions are to describe uh, the special case of the first person narrative where the author pretends to be somebody else and uh, dramatic texts where the author writes a play where the burden of pretense is shifted from author to actors and the text of the play functions as a set of directives as to how the actors are to carry on the pretense. All right, but now then, uh, there are a whole lot of other complexities. I, I mean, I think that's a, a right account. I wrote this a long time ago, but I think it's correct. I think this is the right way to see fiction. However, there are lots of interesting further uh, developments, uh, further things we need to say. One, the author often does have commitments of a non-fictional kind. Uh, so I think in the case of Marguerite uh, Yorsenar, she actually is committed to the existence of uh, the uh, uh, city of Milan and the Duke of Savoy and the conflict between the uh, French king uh, and the Italians. I think she is committed to them. What's the mark? The mark is what counts as a mistake. Uh, if it turns out there never was such an event as the war that she uh, ad ad adverts to here, as the war she mentions here, then she's made a mistake. What counts as a mistake will determine what she's committed to. So the commitments vary enormously from one type of literary genre to another. In science fiction, you can get away with all kinds of things that you cannot get away with in a work of naturalistic literature. Uh, so in Slaughterhouse-Five, Vonnegut switches back and forth between a completely naturalistic, <coughs> naturalistic account of the bombing of Dresden and a science fiction account where, uh, what's his name, Billy Pilgrim goes to the invisible planet Tralfamador in a microsecond. Now there, the uh, rules are off. I mean, there, the, uh, that's, that's science fiction, so he's not committed to this being a possible thing to do. But the account of the bombing of Dresden that occurs uh, in Slaughterhouse-Five is a naturalistic account. He's not committed to the details, but there actually was such an event that I think he is committed to. So we need a further distinction. We need a distinction between a work of fiction and fictional discourse because not all of the utterances in a work of fiction are fictional. There is, in fact, a set of, not in a typical novel, there are a set of non-fictional commitments, and this will vary with the type of work of literature that it is. Now, to take this one step further, often it occurs in a work of fiction that you will get straightforward claims uh, where the author has a message that he wants to tell you. And uh, Tolstoy, particularly later Tolstoy, is a famous uh, case of this because Tolstoy is always afraid, well, maybe we'll miss the point. You know, maybe we won't get what he's trying to tell us. So he grabs us by the lapels and tells us, now I'm going to tell you the point of all this. The point is this Anna Karenina. She got in trouble by messing around, and you mustn't do that because all happies are happy in the same. And then he goes on and on. I, in this tedious fashion where he's afraid we might not get the moral of the story. That's not fictional. Typically, a work of fiction is intended to convey a message that's not itself part of the work of fiction, that is not itself a fictional message. And uh, that's a straightforward commitment. At the beginning of, of uh, 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 Anna Karenina, 
uh, uh, Tolstoy tell us that happy families are all happy in the same way, and unhappy families are all unhappy in their various different ways. That, I take it, is not part of the story. That is not fictional. He intends that as a serious non-fictional utterance. And Nabokov makes fun of him. At the beginning of Ada, he turns that remark on its head, and he says, uh, all unhappy families are unhappy. Uh, in the same way, and all happy families are happy in their various different ways. He turns the whole thing around as a way of, of poking fun at Tolstoy. Uh, that's ironical. I'm not sure how seriously we should take that, but Tolstoy is quite solemn about this. And there are lots of parts of Tolstoy that are intended to be non-fictional. So the story about Natasha and Pierre, that's purely fictional. Uh, but the Battle of Borodino, Tolstoy is anxious to get across that our great Russian general Kutuzov, much better general than this smarty pants Napoleon from Paris, he come to Russia, we beat the hell out of him because we have Muzhik Kutuzov knows how to beat the hell out of Frenchmen. Uh, I always thought that was just a flat lie, uh, that uh, uh, Napoleon was a much better general. But there's a recent book out about the French campaign that suggests, no, those dumb Russians were pretty good, uh, that they did outgeneral Napoleon. Anyway, this, I take it, is a straight historical debate. It's not about uh, the fictional aspect. Okay, I'm going to stop, but I want to say one last sentence because I want you to think about it, go on on Thursday. Here is the question. Why do works of fiction make such a difference to us? And why is it we have so much trouble telling why? So I think Dostoevsky, if you read Dostoevsky, uh, the world never quite seems the same afterwards. But it's very hard to say exactly why that is so. I'll tell you why on Thursday. <laughs>